sleep. She's like, I don't want to go to sleep. Sleep is boring. And I know, I know she doesn't know what boring means, right? She just had, she heard someone say sleep is boring. She figured that was that was an appropriate thing to say and then say. I mean, that's sort of like Chat GPT does. It's synthesizing something that sounds sounds plausible given the context. And that, you know, she says that, she sees how we, we respond, and then she then she learns something. So we, we do need to do pattern recognition and generation, but we also we also abstract in a way that current neural nets seem not to. And this this part this relates to the huge number of parameters in current neural nets, right? Because I mean you have many, many, many billions, tens, hundreds of billions of parameters. And I think being that big is not necessarily good. I mean, I, I think the more you've abstracted, the more compact your knowledge base can be, can be actually. If you need to have a really, really huge collection of data, that, that means you're probably not doing that much abstraction. And it, I mean, if you look in statistical learning theory, there's a there's a something called minimum description length principle, right? Like a compacting something smaller, a more compact description generalizes better beyond beyond its 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 training data. Now that, of course, there's more subtlety than that. You can have a very large model that that generalizes well under some circumstances. But I, I think you, one way or another, you need to come up with concise abstract approximate summaries of, of your experience rather than just having a huge list of, of special cases in, 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 your, in your mind. And we ground patterns, abstract as we ground linguistic patterns in, in observations, right? So like when my one-year-old says sleep is boring, um, she knows what sleep is because she knows she sleeps. And eventually she'll learn what boring is because she'll hear us say like, you know, waiting in line in the airport is boring or something. And then the grounding of the words in non-linguistic experience certainly gives nuance that you don't get just by connecting words to each other, which ties in with the ability to distinguish truth from nonsense, right? If you're, if you're not grounding anything in non-linguistic experience, it's very hard to distinguish truth. From, from, from nonsense. So creating fundamentally new things, we know how to do that in a way because evolution does that. We have evolution of species, we have the evolution of life from you know bubbling clay pools on, on, on the early earth, right? So it's clear that evolution, which combines pieces of one thing with pieces of another thing and then, then mutates it, it's clear that this is an engine of creativity, and there's a theory called neural Darwinism from decades ago that explains how the brain can do evolutionary creativity by a sort of natural selection among among neural assemblies, right? So I mean, we we know how creativity can work, and there have been neural nets that do evolutionary learning. It's it's not how current deep neural nets are, are, are operating. It's a different sort of way of organi organizing a neural net. And I think you do, you do need something more evolution-like inside your AI mind to get creative improvisation. And reasoning also plays a role. I mean, most people don't reason that elaborately in their everyday lives. On the other hand, if you're going to prove a math theorem or create a new biological hypothesis or build a machine, you're carrying out long series of, of reasoning steps. And you know, this also comes up in, a, in other contexts. Certainly it, I mean it comes up in military strategy. Even even if you're if you're fencing, if you're if you're sword fighting, you're planning five five, ten steps ahead and you you you're carrying out a lengthy lengthy reasoning theory, and this is something current neural nets don't do, it, it, it's quite important. And understanding yourself and the other person you're interacting with, the other mind you're interacting with, I mean, clearly, this is what psychologists call theory of mind modeling, right? We, we model what's in the other person's mind, and we, we learn to remember their, their reactions.
Finally, there is this ability to develop, to fundamentally change yourself. I mean, in psychology, there's a thing of learning from development. Learning, you're basically keeping yourself the same, but you're, you're gaining new skills and abilities. But I mean, like between age two and age 56, which I am now, I haven't just learned new skills. Like my, my whole way of thinking and being has changed a few times in that, in that interval, right? So we're, we're developing, we're continuously morphing ourselves into fundamentally new systems that have some resemblance to, to our previous version. And this, this requires an ability to modify and improve ourselves. Now, again, humans are limited in that. Like, I don't know how to refactor my dopamine receptors or something, right? So I, I, I don't know how to change the way my glial cells work. So we, we have some things we don't modify, but there's a, there's a lot of developmental plasticity over the human lifespan compared to current AI systems, which each system has its fixed architecture. And then you do an upgrade, like you throw out GPT-3 and get GPT-4. But GPT-3 didn't progressively morph itself into GPT-4 or something, whereas humans do develop in that way. So these, these things are all needed, and we have some understanding in the AI field how to do each of these. And there are prototype systems and loads of research papers on each one of these things. But none of them has been put all together into one practical AI system actually, actually doing stuff, right? And there's, there's a lot of possible approaches to breaking through this barrier and getting general intelligence to, to really work. My own approach is now centered on a software system called Hyperon, which is a new version of a system called OpenCog. So OpenCog, my colleagues and I started building in 2008 based on some code that was went back to 2001 or something. We decided two years ago to refactor the OpenCog code base into, into, into a new system, which we're, we're working on now. The theory underlying this is fairly deep, and I won't go into it in too much detail, but there's a paper on arcside.org that I wrote called The General Theory of General Intelligence. And if you, if you look at that paper, you can see the cognitive and math and computer science theory behind this. And uh, there's a series of, like, I don't know what, 10 videos on YouTube I recorded stepping through that, that paper almost line by line. So that the, I mean, the core, conceptual notion, you're viewing a mind as a system that recognizes patterns in itself and the world, including introspectively recognizing patterns in what it has done or should do to achieve certain, certain goals in the world. And the core data structure there is a big knowledge metagraph, which is sort of, metagraph, it's sort of like a graph in the computer sciences, but you can have links pointing to links. You can have links going between three or four nodes instead of two nodes. You can have links going to all subgraphs. So it's a slightly generalized graph. So we have this knowledge metagraph. It lives in RAM on multiple network machines. It also lives in, in a backing, backing database on this. And we represent both knowledge and learning and reasoning algorithms. They're all represented in this, in this knowledge graph. So both the algorithms and, and the data, the programming data are all the same. They're, they're in the knowledge graph. And then parts of the knowledge graph are active, and they act by transforming the knowledge graph. And then there's, you have neural net algorithms in this vast self-organizing graph. You also have probabilistic logical reasoning algorithms. You have evolutionary algorithms. But all of the algorithms are parts of the graph that are engaged with rewriting part, parts of the, of, of the knowledge graph. And so this, uh, this is, OpenCog system, there's two key technical components. One is the, so the knowledge graph is called the atom space, and the nodes and links are called the logical atoms. There's a distributed knowledge graph component that we, we've developed a new programming language called Meta, which is essentially for Meta Type Talk, which is a, basically a programming language designed to compile into a graph to make parts of the graph re rewrite the other parts of it. So for computer science programming language geeks, it's a fairly abstract 
language, which I guess a probabilistically, gradually, dependently typed language. So if, if anyone ever played with weird languages like Idris or Agda, it's sort of a next, next step beyond that in decent of, of dependent typing. But it's, which is a sort of language that not many humans are going to want to program in. <laughs> but, but it's mostly, we're programming it, but it's mostly intended for the AGI to be reprogramming itself, right? So it doesn't need to be that, doesn't need to be that, that you reprogram. So yeah, this is a, a rough diagram of this particular AI system. I mean, the Singularity Net platform is a blockchain-based sort of deployment layer that lets you run all this stuff distributed across many different machines with no central controller. So the blockchain is used to allow decentralized coordination of many machines in the, in the, in the infrastructure. Then you have the Atom space, which is shown to the right. You have the language interpreter for the, the, the meta language, which is called Admisnet. And then various AI algorithms on the left. Uh, neural net libraries, probabilistic, read, probabilistic reasoning, evolutionary pro program loading. And for neural networks, we're not running every neural network inside this knowledge graph. So we, I mean, we can, we can run a neural network in uh, PyTorch or whatever toolkit you prefer. And then we can interface that with with the Hyperon system. And if, if you have worked with PyTorch or things like that, in, in PyTorch you have explicit access to the computation graph. So you can I mean you can take the compute graph of PyTorch and you can you can pull it into the into the knowledge graph and open cog and manipulate and and reason and and modify the compute graph and export it. So we're we're taking this knowledge graph manipulation and reasoning system and we're like hybridizing it and then con connecting it with, with neural models written in, in modern neural, neural net toolkit. So one, 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 one example, which I don't have a slide on, but I'll, I'll just mention it. One example we're working with, you can take a large language model could be chat GPT, we're not using that, we're using our own large language model because we wanted free API access to unlimited amount. So you take a large language model of that nature, you can then use certain methods to extract logical knowledge from it. So you, 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 you basically use few shot learning to train the large language model to output predicate logic formalizations of what it knows. So then when, when, you, when you've gotten the language model to export logical versions of what it knows, then you have a large logic knowledge base representing what the language model learned. You feed that into your reasoning system. Then you can do generalization. You can do inductive, abductive, deductive reasoning. You can spot inconsistencies. You can then take that logical knowledge and you can use that logical knowledge to fine tune the language model based on what the, the inference engine concluded, right? So you're, you're, inter you're interfacing the symbolic model for reasoning with the language model for, for pattern, rec pattern recognition. And there's a lot of different things you can do along, along these lines. Windows 3.1. <laughs> okay, so so there's there's a lot of depth in that previous slide, and if folks have a AI or computer science background, maybe if you ask questions after the talk, we can go, go into that more. But I mean, there's there's a fair bit of Fair bit of math and engineering there, which is hard, 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 to, hard to go through rapidly. I want to talk a little bit about scaling up now. So, you know, neural nets were invented in the 1940s as a math and computer model of, of what happens in the brain. I remember teaching neural nets 
in the University of Western Australia when I was an academic in the computer science and cognitive science departments. I was in, I was in 95, 96. We were doing recurrent back propagation. He had neural network maybe 30 or 40 nodes. And training it would take literally all day on the, on the machines of the university, right? So, and you could do some interesting things. We had, you know, conjugating verbs and so forth. And you could do a little bit of automatic handwriting recognition. It was doing something. The deep neural nets we have now, are, they're a bit different, but they're not fundamentally different from the deep neural nets we were training them with recurrent back propagation. Right? I, I, I mean, the biggest difference is we can just do, like instead of, instead of, you know, 30 neurons with a few hundred parameters, you have a few hundred billion parameters now, right? So, like, where does this come from? Well, it came from the internet, and it came from GPUs and massive multi-GPU server, server farms, and, and so forth. So that having the right infrastructure help tremendously in making these sort of same old algorithms do, do really cool things. And in a way that was luck, because GPUs were really then for rendering computer graphics and, and, and video games, right? And then people found, well, wait, they also work for scientific computing. So it's a, partly that's the story of the power of mathematical abstraction, right? Because <coughs> computer graphics and neural nets, it's, it's all matrix multiplication. So, as long as you can use your matrix multiplication libraries, it'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll be fast. Now, symbolic AI, graph-based AI, evolutionary AI, doesn't necessarily boil down to matrix multiplication. And so the hardware infrastructure that has allowed neural nets to accelerate so tremendously doesn't so directly apply. You can certainly do it. You can use GPUs to accelerate graph-based and symbolic evolutionary AI methods, but it's, uh, it doesn't provide the same payoff it does applied to neural nets or, or rendering of, of, of graphics. And if you get into parallel architectures, at the base level, there's something called SIMD, SIMD architectures, which is single instruction, multiple data stream. Then there's something called MIMD, MIMD data structure, which is multiple instruction, multiple data stream. And then roughly in SIMD parallelism, you have a bunch of processes, but they're all doing the same operation at the same time. In MIMD parallelism, you have a bunch of processes which may each be doing a different thing at the same point in time. And of course, the brain is not synchronous. The, 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 brain, the brain is MIMD parallel. Different parts of the brain are operating at different speeds and sending different neurotransmitters around, around, around and, and so forth. And biological systems are kind of, kind of a mess, right? But an artificial neural net, you can boil down the matrix multiplication, which can then be done on, on the simply parallel hardware, like, like, like GPUs. Now, the 